Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this um, spring colloquium session uh, presented by the School of Library and Information Science at San Jose State. I'm Bill Fisher. I'm on the faculty, and I coordinate the colloquium program for the school. And again, I want to welcome everyone here today, and I want to also thank the school's ACES student chapter and the school's SLA student chapter that are co-sponsoring our uh, presentation today. Uh, we have with us uh, two presenters uh, talking about their experience uh, in offering a course last semester um, using a, a MOOC. And, um, our first uh, first presenter that I'll introduce is Michael Stevens, who's also on the faculty at SLIS, full-time faculty member. Came to San Jose State in fall of 2011, and Michael's uh, teaching focus is on user-centered services and outreach using technology, and also uh, learning programs in library settings. Uh, in addition to his, his work uh, that we'll hear about uh, in just a few minutes, he's done uh, a great deal of work in other uh, avenues of technology in library settings. He is also the project director for the Salzburg Curriculum Initiative, which is an IMLS-funded project, and Michael speaks uh, both across the country. He was in um, Texas last week at the Texas Library Association meeting giving a presentation as well as internationally um, and his I think most recent international trip was in New Zealand this past fall uh, speaking to the New Zealand Library Association there. Michael if you want to say hello please. Hello everybody thank you for coming thank you. Great. And with um, Michael today, his co-presenter will be Kyle Jones, who also co-taught the course uh, that will be the focus of our presentation today. Kyle um, is currently a uh, PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and teaches you know, on topics related to digital, digital tools, trends, and controversies. Uh, he's done a, a number of things with Michael as well as um, on his own, and he's currently researching information ethics and privacy issues uh, in American higher education institutions. Kyle, would you say hello, please? Sure. Hey, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm so thrilled that we have alums, we have guest lecturers. This is going to be a great get-together, so thanks for taking the time to join us. Great. Thank you. And uh, as Kyle's mentioned, we've got a great mix of individuals online right now, and I suspect some other people will join us soon. So let me turn things over to Michael and Kyle and let them start their presentation. Uh, and we'll save uh, questions for the end, uh, and we'll, we should have time for some interaction with um, both our speakers at that point. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Thanks for uh, starting us off. Um, again, hello, everybody. I'm Kyle Jones, and I will start the, the beginning of our presentation today um, talking a little bit uh, about the technology side of things. But here's our agenda going forward. We'll give you a brief overview. Um, we'll talk about the uh, bespoke environment, the learning environment uh, that we built custom for our MOOC. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the MOOC experience, uh, experience, which is coming out of some survey data that we gathered, some pre and post survey data. Some roles for LIS professionals, uh, again, based on a paper that Michael and I wrote. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what has happened after the Hyperlib MOOC, which has really taken Michael and I by surprise. Um, there's been a great uh, community and just um, enthusiasm still for the MOOC that's continued. And then we'll talk a little bit about some next steps uh, going forward in terms of research, in terms of um, future endeavors we want to do, including uh, Hyperlib MOOC 2.0. So I'll talk about that a bit. Um, 
so actually I should just go back to, uh, we'll just talk about the overview real quick. So um, last fall we uh, taught a MOOC, um, I guess more of a, a smaller to medium sized MOOC uh, of about uh, 360, 363 students um, focused on uh, Michael's um, hyperlinked library uh, model that he's been um, working on and teaching uh, for a number of years. Um, and so we did that uh, by using uh, a bespoke environment. And by bespoke environment, I mean an ex a, a one-off custom environment uh, where we did not rely on uh, learning management systems, traditional learning management systems like Moodle or Canvas, uh, nor did we go to Coursera to host our MOOC. This is something that we developed all on our own. So I'll walk you through um, all of those different steps and some affordances of the system. But first I want to start with a, a quotation by Peter Morville that I, I love. It's something that I like to use when I'm talking about web design, specifically web design for instructional uh, experiences, learning experiences. And Peter, and Peter Morville said that the LMS information architecture shapes the quality of the academic experience. And I just can't stress this enough. Um, I've worked, uh, I've built these custom systems for learning experiences before and I've worked in a support role uh, for librarians and faculty alike um, in their online learning um, courses. Uh, and and I, can't, I can't really state it enough that what you put into the architecture of the LMS um, really defines in part, I think in a, in a great part, um, the experience of, of the students, the, the learning experience, the community experience, um, and the relationship building that goes on uh, between students and instructors. And so it's one of the things that's really motivated me in this project is saying I have this blank canvas. Um, what can I do with it to really be an architect of learning, to, to shape the academic experience in such a way that is uh, that gets to certain learning outcomes and gets to certain learning experiences. So we decided to roll our own or build our own bespoke environment um, using um, one uh, foundational technology, WordPress, and then building on top of that um, the BuddyPress uh, plugin which goes on to it. So WordPress is a custom or a content management system. Um, primarily it's known for blogging but as Polly knows, one of our visitors and one of my co-authors on a lot of WordPress articles, um, WordPress can do a lot more than just blogging. Um, and it has been able to do a lot more than just blogging for a number of years now, but as of late it's really come into its own as being a, a very good uh, community, um, a, a, like a, a local community type environment. And what enables that community type environment is the BuddyPress plugin that goes into it. Um, and it's a comprehensive plugin, and I'll talk about all the affordances of it um, moving forward. And if you want to, please play along at home. Go to mooc.hyperlib.sjsu.edu. Thanks, Michael, for putting in the link. Um, all the content is still up, um, including all the student content, all the course content, all the lectures, all the guest lectures, all the reading materials, everything, it's still up there. You're more than welcome and you're more than encouraged. I mean, you're encouraged to go and uh, take a look and see for yourself what exactly we did, what exactly we built. And um, if you read through some of the student blogs and posts, you'll get an, an idea of what their experience was like and what they took away from it. Um, I'm not going to say it's a, a complete snapshot of everything. I think some students may have gone in there and um, deleted their blogs or their accounts. Uh, which they're free to do, um, but feel free to go in and take a look. So I want to talk a little bit about the community spaces um, in this course site because we took a CMOOC approach uh, in contrast with an XMOOC approach. And, and what I mean by that is that a CMOOC approach is supposed to be very community centered. It's supposed to be emphasizing uh, knowledge creation and connected learning uh, among peers and by peers instead of what the X MOOC does, which is really the traditional, I guess, kind of MOOC that we have now, or the Coursera style MOOC, is that it's the sage on the stage approach. The um, I am the instructor and therefore I'm going to lecture at you and you're going to take all of the knowledge that I have given to you and then in some form um, give it back to me. Uh, that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted an environment that would be community-centered 
um, and that would encourage students to make, uh, to go through their own sense-making processes uh, and engage each other in those. And so there are what I think are, are three main community spaces. The first is the, the personal space, and that's where students um, have a blog, they have a student profile, um, it's more about them, but it means, but it still means that the community can come and see who they are and engage with them in their own blog uh, posts. The second community space is the course space, uh, and this is where uh, a lot more of the community features come in, and I'll, and I'll talk about the tribes, which, which are synonymous with groups. Uh, I'll talk about the homerooms a little bit. Um, this is where you see all the rest of the peers in the course and the activity updates. And then you have this third space, which is the global community. And the, the space that really, as we talk about in a paper we just submitted, uh, really came together organically uh, for the most part. Students, you know, carried the conversations onto Twitter. Um, they created their own groups in Goodreads uh, and in Facebook. Um, and they, they shared some of their credentials that they, that they earned in the course using the, the Credly badges system. All right, so some brief statistics about the course. I mean, we had, we had two instructors. We had nine guest lecturers, um, of which one is with us, Michael Casey. Thank you, Michael, so much again. If I haven't said it already, I know Michael has, but perhaps I haven't. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, no, you rock, Michael. <laughs> um, we had 363 registered students. We had about 310 blogs. Um, so you can see there that there's a little bit of a discrepancy. Not everybody chose to blog, and that's okay. Um, we had 10 homerooms, uh, about 4,000 blog comments, um, and nearly you know 3,800 badges unlocked, status updates up to 2,080 tribes and groups. So we had a lot of activity, and I think. What's important here is that there's a diversity of activity. In other MOOC environments, the activity uh, is pretty central to the discussion forums, and that's the place you go, you respond, you interact with your peers, and one of the goals that we had going into this is that we wanted to design a space that would allow um, individuals to find their own niche in the, in the course environment and um, be able to interact with students however they chose um, and not be uh, forced into a certain box of, uh, of learning. So activity-based learning. And what we mean by this is, is uh, that we wanted uh, the life of the course environment um, or the activity of the course environment to be front and center. So everybody could post updates, a la like a Facebook update or a Twitter update. Um, and they could post those updates uh, in, uh, in the tribes. Um, I'm sorry, those updates could be shown as, uh, as regular activity updates or profile updates. They could be shown as comments that have gone on throughout the site. Uh, when people um, join a tribe or a group, uh, when they add um, posts to those tribes or groups, when they become friends, et cetera. And you can see that all of those different activity types um, kind of in that drop-down box in the screenshot. Uh, and what this shows here is the main activity page of the website. So this is like the central hub of content um, that's being aggregated in one area. So I could, if this were a live page, I could scroll down and see, you know, what I've said, what Ben said, maybe what Polly said or, or, or Margaret, keep on scrolling down. And I could comment, um, you know, just right on to that activity post. And so, okay, so here's a really good example. Uh, if I were to scroll down, you can see that, you know, Vicki wrote a new post, and that post is in this central aggregated area. And I get a little bit of a snapshot about what she said. And if I want to read more of it, I can click on her blog, or I can go directly to the post. I can also favorite it, um, et cetera. It says that I can delete it just because I'm in there as an administrator right now. Um, you can see that Sally did comment on a post, and that Julie unlocked a, a badge. So it's a great example of, um, I think, really good design for one, because the problem with a lot of CMOOC style MOOCs is that they tend to create a lot of content in a lot of different areas, and the hard part is getting them aggregated, getting all that content aggregated into one central location. And so our activity feature uh, really allowed us to do that, which um, assisted uh, with community development. As, a, as, in, as was indicated in the surveys, the post-course surveys. So we had blog-based learning, like we said. Um, a lot of students 
were encouraged, actually all students were encouraged to create a blog. Uh, if you were going for a certificate, which we did offer, the SJSU Certificate of Completion, uh, one of the required assignments was to blog. Um, so you can see uh, that in this blog directory page, I can get an idea of all of the different people who are blogging, get, a, get an idea of what their latest post was, and, and click right into it. And one of the things that I know Michael and I like to talk about when we use blogs in our, in our classroom experiences, or our online teaching experiences rather, is that blogs become a part of the student's identity. Um, and I say that because, I mean, we have a great example here with, with Edo, or Edo, um, who put not only his face in the header of the, of the blog, but he also put the logo of his uh, library where he works. And so this is just a, a small part of identity formation. And students could do much more than just change the header image. They could change the theme. They could change all the widgets. They could um, change the colors. And it sounds very simple. And it sounds like something that's not all that important. But giving students a sense of space in an online course environment um, is, is actually very important. It's very important. Um, it, it, it helps with engagement. It helps with community development because people know who each other uh, are. Um, and so that's been, um, as the survey data has shown, that's been a really important part of the uh, technological kind of uh, features of the course site. And then, of course, each blog post has comments that are associated with it. And this is where a lot of conversations actually took off. So here was a really good example. Um, somebody asked, you know, is this, is this MOOC? Is this for professional development or on your own? And I think um, she went on to explain her own views on it. And it created a massive discussion, uh, 55 replies. So the community-based learning, um, we've already talked a little bit about it. But here's a social. A network analysis of the groups and people's connections to the groups, groups and individuals, I should say. So the pink circles are groups, and the white circles are um, individuals. And so you can see two pretty big white circles in the middle, and that's uh, Michael and myself. And then you can see the pink, larger pink circles, uh, which are, are groups. And so you can see that. Uh, yeah, groups, thanks, Kate. Uh, groups are the same as tribes. I, I use them interchangeably. Um, and you can see that on the outside, we have some individuals who are you know, only connected through maybe another peer or whatnot. But then we also have this central um, uh, crew of individuals and groups where a lot of the activity is going on. And so the actual, the biggest group there, kind of off center to the left, is our uh, I think the library resources group, um, which became very active in the course. Uh, we had um, homerooms. So I think we had 10, in the end, 10 different homerooms. Homerooms were led by um, either SJSU uh, Swiss students or volunteers from other LAS programs. Um, that became kind of the homeroom leaders. They were the people who helped people who helped the students get comfortable, helped them answer some some technical questions. Um, they were very good conduits between ourselves, uh, the instructors, and the larger course community. Um, and uh, homerooms were also advantageous um, for the development of the course. Here's a good example of a tribe, and, and these tribes are. We, we call them tribes based on Seth Godin, um, Seth Godin's concept of tribes. And, and, and a tribe is a space uh, where an individual leads this group of people based on what he or she uh, has an affinity for, a major interest in, and wants to lead people uh, about a certain topic. So each student could create as many tribes as he or she wanted based on what they were interested in. Um, and some tribes took off. You know, so this library management one had 45 peers. Some tribes did not. And that's OK. That's, you know, tribes um, have their own life. And they have their own interest group. Um, or they, they, they garnered interest um, based on the amount of activity that they tried to create and also what the topic was. So badge-based learning. Um, we also had a badge system built in uh, to the course site. And badges are a way of recognizing students for skills and knowledge learned. And so we had, um, I should step back a little bit and say that 
part of the development of the MOOC started in the summer before the course began, and we had four groups of SJSU students help with um, four different projects. So one of those projects was doing some of the badge conceptualization. Uh, they built the badge model, and then they also built the technology behind it, or they built it into the course site. And students could earn checkpoint badges, which helped to lead towards a master badge. Um, and those checkpoint badges were related to content um, learned in the course. Uh, they were tied to activities, so writing blog posts or writing comments. Um, and also, part of the badge system was to help students get uh, acclimated with the system. So, you know, a simple badge would be deleting a blog post. And while that's kind of silly, it's also a good way to encourage students to interact with the system and get to know it a little bit better. So here's uh, an example of Credly, and Credly was, um, it is a, a web service that you can, um, I guess, uh, give badges to individuals. So what we would do is we would keep a tally of who has earned what. And let's say Johnny wanted to have his badges exported out of the MOOC and brought into Credly, then we would also award them in Credly. So because, you know, if the MOOC site goes down, uh, then those badges go away. But doing it through Credly, um, we could award those badges and that they could have a continued life and students could share them um, greater, uh, in greater ways outside of the course site. All right, so now let's step into a little bit of the research of the MOOC. Um, so here is a, a good snapshot of some of the population of our MOOC. Um, I think we did this maybe in the third or fourth week. We said, hey, you know, everybody in the course, um, if you want, why don't you drop a pin on this Google map to demonstrate kind of where you're at in the world and where you're taking this course. And so we had really an international population, um, which I have to admit did not sink into me until one night I was having a conversation with my mother-in-law about the course. And I was like, I, I taught a course for people in China, in people in South America, in Australia. And it just really sank in that this was a, a very much an international uh, teaching and learning experience, which um, it, it was amazing for me personally. And so for the surveys, we did a pre and post um, survey. Uh, we had 196 students complete the pre-course, 151 do the post-course, and those are pretty good response rates for those. And then we uh, coded um, the qualitative survey responses. So the qualitative survey responses were um, the open-ended um, text-based responses. Uh, we reviewed them, edited them, put them in a master codebook. And so the findings that we'll talk about um, for the most part, are all based on those codes that we came up with. Uh, one of the major themes that we saw was uh, talking about what the students said their, experience, their expectations were going into it. And a lot of students said that they really just wanted to understand MOOCs better. Like, what, what is it about their design or their structure um, or our particular approach to the MOOC that, um, that would be interesting to them um, or to compare it with other experiences that they had? And additionally, um, a lot of students say, well, you know, what's the connection here between MOOCs and library and information science? Um, specifically, what, what could they learn from the MOOC or the MOOC experience that could help them in their own professional capacity or to share back with their employer? Of course, uh, a lot of people also said that, you know, they wanted to take advantage of the convenience of the course, um, being that it was online, being that it was asynchronous, um, that it was easy to access, that, uh, you know, they could take it wherever they wanted. As one of our students did, she was able to take it to the pool and listen to the lectures. So there was a lot of portability involved with the, uh, with the MOOC, and that's what they were expecting. Uh, but this was also an experience of a lifelong learning and professional development for some people. Um, and as Michael and I noticed that we're in an era of shrinking professional development budgets, um, and we have to make some adjustments to it, and MOOCs are a very great way to do that, we think. Uh, and one of our you know, kind of goals in this project was to demonstrate, hopefully demonstrate a successful MOOC for other LIS programs and say, here's a way that you can provide professional development uh, to others. 
So, and then finally, students wanted to connect um, with a global course population, which, as you can see from the map, um, that is definitely what we had. We had a, you know, not, not a completely representative sample of the globe, but we had a, a very much an international flair. Also, uh, here's a great quote. Um, one of the students said, it's a wonderful opportunity for professional development from my desk. There's also something uniquely intriguing about MOOCs, the massiveness, the global participation, the exploration of new virtual landscapes. And on the outs or, or exiting the MOOC, this is what students had to say about measuring their own success. So they, they talked about their own success in terms of, um, you know, completion. And they judged their completion of the course based on if they viewed the lectures or all the lectures, you know, the amount of materials they read, uh, if they completed the assignments and stuck with the course as they said to the end. And success was also based on interaction, you know, did they feel that they had actually engaged with the course community, with their peers. But unfortunately, a lot of students also said that um, time was not their friend, that they lacked it. Um, in that it decreased the, uh, the participation or the level of participation that they could have in the course. Um, and one of the, the lower codes, um, but still relevant, said that, you know, they, they talked about success in terms of if they had a knowledge of the core concepts and models, um, but also, also if they felt that they could apply them in their professional setting. Another quote from one of our students, she said, I finished the required amount of assignments, watched all of the lectures, and read an overwhelming majority of the material. Also, I felt invigorated to be a librarian while taking the course. I came out of the course with real meaningful ways to make my library a better place for patrons. I know that warmed um, my heart and also Michael's to hear some of these comments that they were, uh, that they had a, a renewed sense of invigoration in being an LIS professional. Uh, students also reflected on what worked for them. They said, you know, the, the social experience, um, the connectedness they had with their peers, the idea that they, they built a professional network was important, that it worked for them, that it was, you know, as it matches their, their ideas coming into the course, that convenience was helpful, they appreciated it. Um, they enjoyed the content in terms of the readings and the lecture format. And uh, the global LAS community in the course um, was great because it added a significant amount of diverse perspectives. And then just this last quote, um, I really enjoyed getting to learn from other professionals about what is going on in the larger library world rather than being only focused on my work at my individual library, which, you know, is probably what a lot of um, professionals feel when they have, you know, in-house um, professional development days or workshops. This gave people a real chance to see what other people were doing uh, and what other issues people had uh, in a lot of different environments in LAS. So Michael, I think I'm handing it off to you at this point. Nice, cool. I, I've been watching um, the folks come in. And Kyle, thank you for, for that uh, overview of uh, the technology and uh, the research. Um, I realized and that we have uh, joining us here today, and I think this is very cool, uh, our guest, one of our guest lecturers, uh, at least one of our homeroom guides and our alums as well as um, faculty and students from SLIS. So I think that's really cool to see everyone uh, come together and that makes me very happy. I also want to say uh, Michael is here, Michael Casey, he worked with Information Today, the publisher, to get everyone that took the MOOC a free copy of one of the texts that I use in the hyperlink library and that we use in the MOOC, uh, Michael's book, Library 2.0, A Guide to Participatory Service. So that was very cool as well. Instead of um, making people buy a book or, or whatever, we actually got to give it to them for free. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what, what folks took away. Sorry for this weird formatting issue. Uh, but it's what people took away from the course. And one of the things that we didn't have a great big slide on is the fact that we, we ask folks, do you feel you were successful? And 76% of the people that took the post survey said, yes, I felt I was successful uh, in this MOOC. So we asked them to sort of tease that out a bit. And the, the follow-up question, what did you, what do you think you gained the most? And here's a breakdown in order of occurrence of um, what folks said. 
Uh, of course, they came away with new ideas and new knowledge. They got to network, which we've heard um, before as well. Uh, they got to network and collaborate and, and work with other folks. And this third one, and it was the third um, uh, most prominent, but this one really sort of touched me, that they gained insights about themselves, they, uh, they, about their learning style, about um, the way they might approach online learning, and just some personal reflections. And I think some folks um, really took that to heart and that made me happy. And we saw this in an earlier quote that uh, folks experienced a renewed outlook uh, with the profession, maybe more excitement about doing their jobs. So here's one of the quotes uh, we pulled out, seeing all the new tech in action and seeing what we can actually use it for and realizing that it is for me and not just other people. So this person sort of had uh, an awakening about using these technologies. Oh, so here's another quirky little slide. Uh, this is reflecting back on their expectations uh, of uh, what, what they went into the book with, and then we asked them at the end to, to think about those things. And they said, well, I wanted to finish, but I didn't. And one of the other numbers uh, we should throw out there for you, we did have 363 uh, uh, folks join us at the beginning of August. And uh, one, one measure of finishing the MOOC, and I just did air quotes, was completing the certificate from San Jose SLIS meaning you did a certain amount of things. Uh, and we gave 53 of those, which comes out to be about 15%. Um, so a lot of other people said, I wanted to finish, but something came up. Life intervened, et cetera. Uh, most felt that the MOOC exceeded their expectations. They learned about modern library practices on a global scale. And overall, most folks said it was a good experience. And this makes me happy. And I, I got to tell you, we, this, is, this is a true representation of the data because I, I'm always looking for, for the things where people are like, this wasn't very good, this wasn't very good. And those things did not rise to the top uh, as they would. And we would certainly report them um, if they did. Here's another quote. Uh, this person uh, knew they wouldn't be able to get their certificate, but they wanted to try, but just things uh, didn't work out. But I did learn a lot about participating in an online learning environment, which was a primary goal. Uh, we, we also took away in uh, the various questions we asked uh, some recommendations for going forward, and we will be offering uh, hyperlink library uh, MOOC in the spring, and this is going to help us sort of, I think, put it put it together, kind of change it up a bit. We'll be refining the course site. Mm -hmm. uh, we got some really good feedback about that. We'll be reducing the workload a bit, and this is so interesting. That every, people said in the research that um, they couldn't do all of the reading, and I never, ever, ever expected anybody in the MOOC to do all of the reading, but I think it might come down to that sort of personality type that a lot of, a, a lot of us are in our profession that we, you know, we want to do it all, we want to do it all really well. So people, if they saw a list of 20 articles, they felt they had to read them when right up at the top, Kyle and I had said, uh, pick and choose the ones that resonate with you or the ones that speak to you or the ones that sit into what you're interested in. Uh, but still, we might reduce that workload so people feel um, that it can be uh, manageable. And then we'll, we'll be adjusting the course length as well. We went for um, 12 weeks, 12 weeks, and a, a Swiss semester is 15. So we went almost as long uh, as a regular uh, semester. So uh, here is a wonderful quote, and I think, Kyle, when you did this slide at Elise, uh, you read this as though it was a haiku. I don't know if I can do that justice, but too much content for the time frame, ever increasing feelings of guilt. <laughs> kind of beautiful and kind of sums up um, how uh, one person felt about the amount of uh, content we put out there. So one of the other things that we did in our post survey is we asked people, now that you've been in a large scale online course, what do you see as the role that you might play or that librarians might play uh, in large-scale learning in MOOCs. And this is the neat thing that Kyle and I have been able to do, and we've been really working like crazy this winter um, 
we got a paper uh, out for for uh, uh, JELUS, the Journal of uh, Library Information Science Education, but we also have a conference paper uh, that we wrote, and I'm going to troop out to Denver next week and present it just on this one question at the Distance Librarian Conference in Denver. So. Uh, Look, looking at that one question, we did the content analysis on it. Whoops, there we go. And we found, again, in order of prominence, that folks said, uh, I see librarians being guides within these spaces, meaning that they show people where resources are and they show people how things, uh, how to find their way through these spaces, through these, these learning spaces. Uh, they also see themselves as access providers, that they would provide access maybe to the MOOC, maybe to uh, the, the various um, resources that make up uh, the, the open, uh, open materials that are shared via the MOOC, that they are there to do that thing that we do so well in libraries, uh, again, to provide access. They might also be uh, instructors to a certain degree. Uh, and that would be not necessarily um, teaching within the MOOC, but they might be instructing in different ways to help people satisfy the requirements of the MOOC. For example, showing someone how to make a, uh, um, a video or something like that. And guess what? Um, I think we dropped one of our roles here. So I will just tell you, uh, right before this one, there should have been another one that was creator. And that was the actual creation of large-scale learning. Uh, that would be the role of librarian as MOOC creator, where they might actually design a MOOC. Um, maybe, for example, in an academic library, you might teach a MOOC on information literacy or digital li literacy or those things that you need to be a successful student. That might be an example of that. I apologize for creator not showing up there. It's kind of quirky that it didn't. <clears throat> um, Librarians will also be connectors, and that's putting people together. And I see this really uh, in our MOOC and in uh, hopefully in future CMOOCs that I'm involved in. Uh, I think this role could be very important, and that's putting, helping put groups together, helping put individuals together that enables them uh, to learn. And then finally, uh, the role of the learner. And this is that important thing, that professional development thing that, that I will always continue to learn even after I have finished my degree, even after I have gone back for a postmaster certificate, that I will be a lifelong learner as an information professional. Uh, just to say, um, <laughs> Margaret uh, says always, 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 absolutely. Just to say a word about this graphic, this, this is sort of like the, the point that resonates so much with me. Uh, about the experience that we had last fall with, with the MOOC. I was in New Zealand uh, to speak at Lianza, and we had a wonderful contingent of librarians in our MOOC from New Zealand, and one of them, uh, Kath, came up to me in the hallway of the big conference center, and she said, I made you something, uh, and this is what I'm taking away from the MOOC. And she had hand-painted uh, this little heart, and it says, show kindness on it, and that's a big deal. And for the students with me in Hyperlink Library right now, and I know I have a couple of you in the room, you know, this is really what we're talking about in our 15 weeks together. You know, how do we do this uh, in our libraries and in, in our spaces? So uh, that said, let's talk a little bit about what happened after the Hyperlink Library MOOC or, or things that were happening as we were winding up. And then we will uh, turn it over for questions from the group. Uh, here's Joe, Joe Hardenbrook, um, who uh, is a blogger and uh, uh, uses Twitter, and he put this up uh, in December, just as around the time the MOOC was, was just about done, and he says, not saying that Hyperlib MOOC was the reason I got a new job, but I did get questions on it during my interview. It was a great learning experience. And that really, that makes me happy. I think that's, uh, that's a good thing. Um, it also speaks to the fact that this is something that if you were in the MOOC, you can talk about. And if you were a participatory learning guide, and I know Joanne is here, uh, who was one of the, the guides in the MOOC, that that's something else that will go on her, her CV, on her resume as she looks for a job. Um, so I think that's a, um, that's a big deal. Yeah, participatory learning guide, also known as homeroom leader. And there's Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. 
Uh, okay, here's Megan. Hold on to your hats, everybody. <laughs> this is this one is a hoot. So she says, so far in the first three weeks, I've gotten more out of Hyperlib MOOC than I did out of my entire MLIS, and this time it is free. Does she put this up in September? Uh, retweeted a number of times, favorited a number of times. Uh, I used this slide in Texas and somebody shot their hand up and said, uh, what school did she go to? And I said, I'm not going to tell you. You might be able to find out. I will tell you. It certainly is not San Jose, Sliss, uh, but Megan did get some, uh, some good stuff out of the MOOC. The other thing, and this had nothing to do with Kyle and I, um, a hearty group of like the, the core active folk in the Hyperlink Library MOOC uh, realized as we were ending that they wanted to continue being a community and they uh, they put up a little survey, we put it up on the, the main uh, MOOC blog for everybody to have access to it and they formed a little blog community and a uh, Facebook page and this is a screenshot of the Facebook page for the Hyperlink Library alumni and it actually is billed as anybody that's ever taken the Hyperlink Library class or the MOOC uh, can join this and I've been posting in it today um, promoting this um, this event so that's kind of cool so they're they're continuing um, the conversation uh, way beyond the content that Kyle and Kyle and I provided so that that makes me happy as well and uh, one of the things that came out of that the alumni group is Amy Paget uh, from Indiana Indiana librarian yay I was a Indiana librarian for many years uh, Amy had the little ribbons made for uh, your conference badge. So uh, she passed them out at ALA Midwinter. I had one and I think she uh, met some other folks. I know, yay Hoosiers, uh, at Midwinter. So people wore those around with their, their little ribbons. It might say alumni, this, or uh, I'm a blogger, or I'm a speaker. And I actually wore one in um, uh, Texas as well just uh, last week for Texas Library Association. I have a little stack of these. Amy uh, gave me some. I will be at the uh, ALA in Vegas. That sounds so funny to say ALA in Vegas. Uh, but I will be there and uh, we will be at the uh, Big Sliss reception and I, I'll be passing these out and we'll also have them at our Sliss booth if any of the alumni uh, here in the, uh, the meeting or listening to the recording would like to have one. So what are the next steps? We'll talk just briefly and then um, I want to open it up to questions because I'm really interested to hear from you all. Here's where we are right now and if you look at this, Kyle, it kind of makes me a little tired. Um, we've done a lot of stuff. I've been really, really pleased and proud with what we've done. Um, we were able to go to the Association of Library and Information Science Educators Conference in a very wintry, blizzardy Philadelphia in January and do a uh, jury paper and a jury panel about the MOOC. Um, out of that came an article that has already been accepted. I'm so excited about this in the Journal of Education for Library and Information Science. That will appear before the end of the year. Um, we have submitted an article um, uh, on uh, uh, looking at uh, the MOOC um, uh, for the, the, sorry, the bespoke learning environment. I believe that's in the Journal of Learning Spaces. And I wrote sort of a pre, this is what we're going to do piece uh, last summer um, about it in internet learning. So I'll be out in Denver giving the paper that Kyle and I wrote uh, about roles as well. So uh, the, the next things, what are the next things? We are, and I'm going to click over here because I have it open in my browser. We're working with, um, Hello, sorry, with uh, Joanne DeGroot and Jennifer Branch on another uh, aspect of the post survey. We asked some questions about community and how people perceive community within uh, the MOOC. And um, Joanne and Jennifer have done some things looking at community and affinity spaces and they recorded videos for us for our release panel and I just put in a URL there. If you can take another 20 minutes to sort of augment your learning from this colloquium, uh, run over there sometime and listen to their words because they, they pull out some data from, uh, from the MOOC survey and it's so interesting. So we'll be working with them on a paper uh, about community and affinity spaces and I think the tribes are really, really good examples of um, how uh, affinity spaces might play out. 
We're also looking at doing an alumni survey, possibly in the fall, just to see how that first hardy group that went through with us, how they're doing, what impact the MOOC had, and what uh, thoughts they might have uh, a year later, just to see. And then, as we said, we've said a couple of times, we're going to be offering uh, the Hyperlink Library massive open online course in spring of 2015, and there'll be uh, more put out about that as we go forward. And uh, hopefully we'll have some students that want to work with us as learning guides, et cetera. So here's about us, and I think we will uh, open up the floor to questions, if that's cool. I appreciate your attention. Yes, great. Uh, thank you both Kyle and Michael uh, for the presentation. And we do have some time for questions or comments from the uh, participants. If you want to um, raise your hand uh, or just grab the mic, that's, that's fine, or put something into the uh, chat box. Either of those will work. Um, I do have a, a quick question actually. Um, Michael and Kyle, with the um, course next spring, um, if somebody took the course already, has gone through the experience, would there be uh, like uh, a little section in there with, that would almost be like an advanced uh, hyperlink that you could have an alumni group participate uh, next spring? Uh, I've thought about that, and I think Kyle and I have talked about it in various ways. I think something will happen, and I think we'll make something available to the alumni in some way. Uh, but I hadn't actually thought of it that way that we might open up some some slots just in the actual uh, in the actual course and then provide advanced stuff, which is I remember that in the uh, in the survey data that somebody said I want advanced stuff now or, or whatever they said. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about too, Michael, is that in the survey somebody asked for an advanced track, but um, definitely I think there's a role there to be filled um, either as a learner or as a um, kind of a, a kind of like a personal learning guide for uh, alumni of the course. And I think just off the top of the head, one of the things I would love to see is some kind of uh, video uh, kind of like a journal entry about, you know, talking to the new cohort of hyperlink library students about their experience, what they got out of it, and what you think, uh, you know, what they think students should do to optimize their learning experience. I think that would be really powerful to hear from, from past students um, in talking to the new ones. Absolutely. Okay, we've got a comment um, in the chat box, and I need, I need to read this for when the um, recording comes out on uh, YouTube because they don't see the chat stuff. So uh, Patty writes that in our regional system we promoted a MOOC from the Toronto I School on advocacy. We encourage participation by offering a face-to-face -face gathering after week one and week six. Participants, according to the feedback, found the face-to-face -face very helpful for discussion of the learning and kept them on track. So. I don't know if you guys want to comment on that uh, or not. Uh, I would. I've heard, I heard some great things about the advocacy MOOC, and I actually was uh, chatting with Stephen Abram about it at Texas Library Association because he was uh, involved uh, with that as well. Um, and I think this is a really interesting idea, and I think that's something that maybe we might be able to uh, to uh, suggest to folks. Um, that maybe if uh, a library, for example, if a library system is going to get some people in it to do the MOOC again with us in the spring, they might offer some face-to-face -face or some, some various ways of, of uh, supporting the learners. That would almost be like what some uh, groups did with some of the original webinars where they uh, sort of used them as in-service type of opportunities and brought groups in and watched or, or participated in the webinar as a group and then after the webinar was over uh, had a sort of face-to-face post-webinar discussion. Right. Yeah, and just to build off of that, Patty says, yes, the, just the combination of light human touch with the online environment um, would be great or would be helpful. Um, and I, I agree. I think that would be wonderful if we could support that somehow, um, either technically or logistically. And I think one of the things that I would like to do next time, and I think, Michael, we've talked about this, is, is have some kind of 
uh, synchronous events with the students, either if that's a Google yes. Hangout or doing it text-based like a Twitter chat, um, you know, an hour every week or something like that. That could provide more of a human touch, I guess, that, that maybe we, we didn't have before, but it wouldn't be like in the flesh in the same room, but yeah. That's great. Okay, we have a, a comment from Margaret uh, who said she took a leadership, took leadership through emotional intelligence MOOC along with a colleague. We did our own study but met weekly to discuss. Especially helpful to talk about how what we were learning could be utilized in our workspace. So that reinforces nice. uh, some of what we were talking about. And I guess what now what Michael, you and Kyle would need to do is figure out how one of you could go spend a week in Europe and then the other one a week in Australia uh, in spring. So you could uh, have those face-to-face -face sessions, right? right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. I think there's an IMLS grant in there somewhere for us, right, Bill? <laughs> Absolutely, guys. You got to go for it. All right, we've got a comment mm -hmm. from Silva. Will you be advertising the upcoming hyperlink MOOC to non-library professionals, uh, perhaps as an effort to rebrand the role of libraries and librarians? That's a great uh, question. Wow, that is a, that's a very interesting question. I I I don't know. I, we certainly could. I know we'll, it will be advertised through all the channels that SLIS uses as well as all of our networks that we participate in. Uh, I guess it just, if it depends on if those messages get uh, to the folks that uh, might be beyond libraries. Yeah, it would be well, challenging to reach out into those venues for non-librarians. I think the other part in the parentheses is interesting. As an effort to rebrand the role of libraries and librarians, I mean, that would be politically loaded if we were trying to market it as a rebranding exercise. But um, maybe there's something in there in terms of getting a, a kind of rethinking or a reflection back on what it means to be. And I think we try to do this kind of implicitly in the in the literature and in the, in the models to rethink what it means to be a librarian in an hyperlinked world. Okay, um, I, I'll read Sinead's comment. Uh, and she says, I think it, sh it should be used as a recruiting tool by MLIS program, certainly by San Jose. It's a fantastic course. Thank you. Uh, Sinead's in the class right now with me, so I appreciate that. Uh, and that's something Kyle and I, when we talked about the alumni survey, that's something we might look into. Did this experience going through a course uh, ho uh, offered by San Jose SLIS lead to some of the, the uh, students coming uh, to the MLIS, to the postmaster certificate, to the uh, uh, any any of the things that we offer. That might be something really interesting to uh, to look into. Right. If you have the list of original names uh, of of that uh, 300 or so number, we can certainly check to see a year Absolutely. or so afterwards who uh, is is a student, or even now with the opportunity to take other courses on a one-off basis, right. uh, we can see if, if that uh, sparks any interest in, in that regard. Um, and then Margaret, one of, who I'll have to admit is one of our alums, um, <laughs> also says that it gave uh, San Jose State uh, even uh, better reputation. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And Michael, uh, Casey writes, uh, so much talk in my library regarding professional development finally being fun and educational, which is always good. Uh, lots of pent up demand with existing librarians and that's, uh, that's a good statement as well, Michael. That's nice. Thanks, Michael. I would think getting back to that one comment about trying to get um, get word out to non-library environments, uh, potentially trying to tap into some of the distance education um, um, network might be useful. And um, we've got people, uh, Michael Stevens, that you know uh, on staff who could potentially help with some of that. Absolutely. And then my, uh, Margaret's got a, a question about any other class you want to develop, and I presume you mean, Margaret, uh, to, to develop, uh, to offer as a MOOC. Yeah, Michael, what's your thought on that? I know, I don't think we've really had a conversation about that um, together, but I mean, I, I look at your, 
what is it, your emerging kind of learning and instructional technologies course is something that could also be extremely relevant in this area. Yeah, uh, transformative learning, it could be a bit, it's almost like it would double around on itself. Um, I am uh, working with Alice, who's here in the room, on some things uh, related to archives. So that may be something that, that we, uh, we roll out uh, an open, maybe not, I don't know what it will be exactly, but Alice and I are working on something. So that digital preservation, thanks, Alice. Thank you. My brain is a little fried right now. So yeah, we're going to look at digital preservation. I'm going to kind of help, uh, help point the way for that. Cool. And yes, Char Booth, absolutely, who was a guest lecturer for Hyperlink Library MOOC, yeah. And there might be something, and one of the things I've been talking a lot about, and this again is just so self-reflexive, is this concept of infinite learning and learning everywhere. So maybe there is something uh, to take away from that. Okay, this is Sinead, and I love this. This is so cool. I also have to say that it was so relevant to me in my current role in a large, not to be named software company in Silicon Valley. It's, a, it's about information, emerging technologies, and hyperlink communities beyond just libraries. Just did a kindness audit, yay for kindness audit, for our onboarding of new hires based on the course. And again, just uh, for everybody, in the room and, and listening, Sinead is in, in, in the class right now with me and she's taken what we're doing in the Hyperlink Library and brought it into her corporate environment. And I really appreciate that comment. Thank you so much. Any other? We still have a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> that's a great comment. Sinead uh, follows up with the new hires, thank you. <laughs> So I, I presume they like the kindness audit too. <laughs> nice. Again, let me thank both Michael and Kyle for their uh, presentation today. And, and thanks, thanks, everybody. Each and every one of you for participating and uh, certainly with some of the comments that uh, helped make the presentation uh, that much more uh, fulfilling. So thanks. and. Um, we will have, this is our last colloquium presentation, uh, general colloquium presentation for the semester, uh, but we will start up again next fall with some colloquium, and those are always uh, advertised and promoted on the SLIS web website. Thank you very much.